Hi everyone. Um, so in this video, I'm going to talk about GC, gas chromatograph, um, a gas chromatograph, and how we're going to use it to, to uh, separate a mixture of accelerants. In this video, I'm going to talk about the experiment that you're going to do where you separate the mixture of accelerants, and, and then probably in a second video, although it's possible we'll end up pasting it to the end of this video, but probably a different video um, that we'll put on the same playlist, we'll talk about how to actually use the instrument. So what does it look like? What do the pieces look like? Um, the auto sampler. Um, what does the software look like? And how do you set it up? So that'll be a separate thing. So it's kind of like two ideas, right? One is the theory, and one is the practical use of the GC. Gas, chromatic, um, gas chromatography is extremely important in forensic science. And if you go to most forensics labs, you'll find banks of these things um, for doing analysis. And the reason that it's so important is it can separate a mixture. Since we're talking about accelerants here, that's the example that I'm going to use. So a gasoline, gasoline, for example, maybe it's 40 or 50 or even more different compounds that are in it. So it's got some toluene and some different isomers of xylene and, and a bunch of other things in it. And in order to analyze it and differentiate it from, say, kerosene, you could separate it into its component mixtures and then using um, often a mass spectrometer, uh, mass spectrometer as a detector, determine the um, components of the mixture and then ultimately determine that it's gasoline. But there are many other cases where separating a mixture is very important. And GC for relatively small organic molecules is a very efficient way of separating mixtures. Drugs of abuse, accelerants like in an arson case, and many other things are relatively small organic molecules where GC works. It doesn't work for everything, um, and HPLC um, can also be used, although often in forensics, the GC will work. So here's what we have. This is the schematic of a um, GC. It starts with the injector port. So the injector port has helium blowing into it. At the other end of the injector port, we have a column. So this ejector port is essentially like a little temperature controlled area. It's usually heated to a, a fairly high temperature, unless there's some kind of thermal decomposition problem, you would heat it up to a high temperature. In our case, we're always gonna heat it up to a high temperature. And then you inject your sample. The, the sample then experiences the high temperature and goes into the gas phase, boils, because this is a very high temperature. Then helium gas blows some of it into the column. We use something called a splitter, which means that some of it is blown off, um, which essentially just helps you from overloading your detector or overloading your column. So basically, that's not super important here. The column, which is 30 meters long, sits in an oven. And this oven can have its own temperature program. You could set it at 100 degrees and keep it at 100 degrees. Or you could set it at 100 degrees and then heat it up to 300 degrees throughout the course of the run. Um, RGCs can heat at about 30, mils, uh, 30 um, degrees C per minute, maybe a little bit less at higher temperatures, um, but this is basically what you can do so that the molecules that are in the column experience a different temperature. In our case, our column is a 30 meter column. This is about 100 feet long, so it's a very long column, and it is essentially a uh, slightly nonpolar material. This column can be used to separate things based on affinity for the stationary phase. However, in this case, um, and most of the cases that you're gonna do in this course, okay, um, it's gonna separate things based on their boiling points. Okay, so it's a pretty um, generic column. There are some specialized columns out there that have been developed because there was a need, and if they're commercially available products, they fulfill this need, where they um, can separate things based on their affinity um, most strongly their affinity for the stationary phase of the column packing material. But in our case, mostly by boiling point. And here's why. Let's say that the oven is at 100 degrees. If a molecule has a relatively low boiling point, then much of it or all of it will be in the gas phase. If it's in the gas phase, it's making its way through the column more quickly. For an, a different molecule with a high boiling point, maybe it's a solid phase at 50 degrees C. So very little of it is in the gas phase, and therefore it's very slowly making its way through the column. At the end of the day, the more volatile molecule, the one with the lower boiling point, will reach the detector first. The one with the higher boiling point will stay in the column longer. Okay, and that's kind of how it works. 
Then finally they reach the detector. The detector that we use is called a flame ionization detector, which is abbreviated FID. Again, flame ionization detector. What this does is it essentially burns the sample. When the sample, when these organic compounds are burned, they create ions temporarily. Those ions flow through um, a device that's capable of measuring electrical charge, and that electrical charge induces a current, and that's what you read and goes out to the detector. So, molecules must be flammable in order for the FID detector to detect them. Water will not be detected by an FID detector. Um, helium will not be detected by an FID detector, but organic things, which will burn, will be detected by an FID detector, and in our case, that's what we're looking at. So in our example, what we're going to do is we're going to put the initial oven temperature at 50 degrees C. We're going to hold it for two minutes. Then we're going to ramp it at 20 degrees Celsius per minute up to 250 degrees C. Once it reaches 250, we're going to hold it for 10 minutes for a total runtime of 22 minutes. You are going to use four analytes and a solvent, so you're going to see five peaks because the solvent is also detectable. So you'll see the solvent first and then your four analytes. Once you see all five peaks come out, you can stop it even if it hasn't been the entire 22 minutes. So you want to make sure that everything um, comes out of your um, GC before you stop your method. And this is basically what we're going to do. This is the oven temperature program. Note that you also, and when we do the video with the actual instrument, you need to set your injector port temperature. You need to set your column flow rate, which is one millimeter always. All right, you need to put some gases to your detector, specifically hydrogen and air, because you have to have a flame. Um, and so all of these things also have to be set. So this is just the oven temperature program. But again, that's a whole separate thing. Theory, and then the practical is a separate thing. So here's what you're going to get, all right? And this is not what you're trying to separate in this experiment. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Um, but this is just uh, an example of, uh, actually, it's a lab we do in the organic lab, um, where we're separating ethanol and toluene. I should point out, it actually isn't, all right? Um, at one time, we had thought about doing this, and that's where this data come from, can, comes from. Now we separate ethanol and butanol in the organic lab. So if you look here, all right, ethanol has a boiling point of 78 degrees C. Toluene has a boiling point of 111 degrees C. In this case, we would expect ethanol to come out first because at any temperature, we would expect the ethanol to be more in the gas phase than the toluene. So therefore, it should flow through the column more quickly. Again, not all columns work this way. And even the column you're going to use doesn't always work this way in every single case. But in most cases, it separates things by their boiling point. So what we're doing is we're noticing that the ethanol comes out first. So we see this peak for the ethanol. I think it's important to look at what the axes are. So the axis here is time. How long after the injection did it take to see a peak for ethanol? And at the very top of this peak, you'll see that it says 2.550 minutes. We call that the retention time. I should also note that these numbers and these numbers are essentially the same. Um, I just put them here so they're a little easier to see. So basically, we have a retention time for ethanol of 2.550 minutes. And we have a peak area of 48.47%, All right, which we just read from the graph here. Toluene. Toluene has a higher boiling point. It comes out later. It came out, it came out at 3.197 minutes and has an area of 51.17%. Uh, All right, has a higher boiling point. If we look at this overall, the ethanol came out relatively quickly, within two minutes. And the toluene only came out about 0.6 minutes later. That's good. This is a good separation. It's very efficient, and it works well. One thing I do want to caution you on, although this will not come up uh, so much in this experiment, is you can't consider that this mixture is 48% ethanol and 51% toluene. The reason for that is this detector detects a current based on the ions that are formed. If things don't burn and give off the same amount of ions or however you want to think about it, they may not give the exact same detector response. 
in this case, what you should do is make a calibration curve for ethanol, make a calibration curve for toluene, and then find the exact concentrations of both of them in the mixture, and then find the percentage. All right. But that being said, that's a lot of extra work. And we can say that this is roughly a 50-50 mixture, and it probably is close. Okay. So this is basically how it works. A couple other things to point out, other than we have the time here. Here we just have picoamps, which is just the size of the signal. You'll see these other things that are labeled. All right, you are going to get some noise here. All right, here you probably have some solvent. You'll notice that this started recording at 2.2 minutes. So you probably have your solvent coming out before two minutes, or at least most of it coming out before two minutes, and it's been chopped off here. The reason we would often chop this off on the chromatogram is that this peak is going to be massive and it'll make these peaks look the size of these peaks or at least significantly smaller. So therefore we can sometimes chop it off. The other thing is we do have some noise here. All right, you can see these other little peaks and that just has to do with the sensitivity of the integrator because we're integrating, we're finding the peak area of these peaks and it's a tricky game, all right? You can make it less sensitive, but it's very difficult to get it to both not ignore all noise and detect your peaks. So therefore, we live with the fact that there's a little bit of noise in here, um, which can come from contaminations in the ethanol or the toluene or the solvent. It could also come from uh, contaminations in the carrier gas. It can also come from electrical noise, and they're very small. We just ignore them. Okay, so this is what you're going to see. So this is what you're going to use, all right, in order to do your separation. And this is the graph you're going to get, and you're going to get the retention times of your different compounds, and they're essentially going to come out by boiling point. Now, what are you going to do in this actual lab? Well, you're going to make, um, this should say 20, um, you're going to make 100 milliliters of 20 millimolar solutions in dichloromethane. Now, it's very important that you come with a recipe for how to make 100 milliliters of 20 milliliter solutions in dichloromethane. So you're going to have all four of these compounds, all right, toluene, octane, nonane, and decane, so eight carbons, nine carbons, 10 carbons, in um, dichloromethane. They all have to be 20 millimolar. You need to be able to make this solution relatively quickly. If you notice your first GC run, it could be as much as 22 minutes. So that's a lot of the lab time. You need to make your solution efficiently. So come in with a recipe. I'm not going to go over that in a, in a 200 level course, um, but come in with a recipe to make these 20 millimolar, all right, or 0 0.02 molar. All right, so that's basically what you're going to do. Now, these are all things you could find in accelerants. All right, so toluene has a boiling point of 111. Octane has 126. Nonane, of course, is more than octane because it's an extra carbon group, so the intermolecular forces are stronger, 151. And we had another extra carbon group, again, increasing the intermolecular forces, specifically the dispersion forces, and we get to 174. All of these molecules are relatively nonpolar, and they're going to come out in the order of their boiling point. So we should expect to see toluene, then octane, then nonane, then decane. Okay, um, sometimes this isn't clear, and if you have just the GC, you would need to shoot a standard, see its retention time on the same method, and compare the retention times to ensure that you have the compound. Another method would be to use a mass spec, which then gives you fragmentation patterns, which you can then identify these different molecules based on their molar masses and fragmentation. So in any case, you're going to make a 20 millimolar solution containing all of these, all at 20 millimolar in dichloromethane. Dichloromethane has a boiling point of 40 degrees C. It will be detected by the detector. However, it should come out first because it's way lower in boiling point than any of these molecules. As we mentioned before, you're going to start with an initial temperature of 50. You're going to hold that for two minutes. Then you're going to ramp it up at 20 degrees C a minute to 250 and hold for 10 minutes for a total runtime of 22 minutes. And then you're going to see what happens. Now, in, your, in this experiment, your goal is to try to optimize this method. So when we say optimize this method, which is a tall task, considering this is the first time you're um, having exposure to the GC, so do the best you can, OK? What do we mean by optimizing the method? What we mean by optimizing the method is we need baseline separation, all right? We need the molecules to be separated completely. Secondly, we want the run to be as short as possible. So we have two competing interests. 
We want to separate the molecules, but we want the run to be as short as possible because if we're running a thousand samples, you would never run a thousand samples of this. But if you were, this was a real case and you had to run a thousand samples of it, you don't want the method to be longer than it needs to be because otherwise you're wasting the time. So let's look at three examples of things we could get. Let's look at the first case. So again, we have the response on the y-axis, we have the retention time on the x-axis. And what we'll notice here is we have great separation, okay? This molecule comes out at six minutes, a little over six minutes. This molecule comes out at a little over nine minutes. So great separation, in fact, three minutes of separation, maybe too much separation. But what I instantly notice when I look at this um, GC chromatogram is look at all this time here. Okay, so it took over six minutes for the first peak to come out. How could, and we have a substantial time between these two molecules. How could we change this? Well, let's say that our initial oven temperature was 50 and we held it for two minutes. What if we set our initial oven temperature to 100 or 125 or even 150? I don't know what it's exactly going to work, but I'm pretty sure that a higher initial temperature um, could work. One way to do this would be to calculate the temperature at which this came out. All right, so if it was 50 for two minutes, then it's 70, then it's 90, then it's 110, then it's 130. It came out at 130. So probably 150 is too hot. All right, you might put these peaks right on top of each other if you do that. So what you might want to do instead is, you know, try 100, 125, something like that, um, in order to separate this molecule. Because if we look at this at around 130, then we have 150, 170, and somewhere around 190 before this one came out. So, you know, you might get away with 130 or 150 as your initial temperature. But increasing the initial temperature, in any case, will decrease the amount of time that it takes for these molecules to come out. Let's look at case two. In case two, um, example two, the molecules were separated, okay, or excuse me, the two molecules came out in about two and a half, three minutes, so just over three minutes, I would guess, all right, but there is no baseline separation. So what are you going to do here? Well, in this case, it's kind of tricky because the molecules came out very fast. So your instinct might be, well, here they came out slow, so we increased the oven temperature, the initial oven temperature. Here they came out fast, so maybe we should decrease the initial oven temperature. The problem is the closer you get to room temperature, the slower the oven cools down. So you have to think about how long an overall run takes. If you have to, if you heat it up and then you have to cool it back down below room te uh, at, to a very low temperature, closer to room temperature, it can be a problem. Um, you can get it down to probably 30 or 35, but it takes forever, all right? So we don't like to try to cool it down below 50. And the reason for that is you have the hot injector, you have a heated detector. These things are giving off heat into the oven, and it's very difficult to get it very cold. It's a super well-insulated oven, and getting it down to uh, room temperature is difficult. Yeah, if you can get it down to 30, even though room temperature might be 20 or 25, it is possible, but you'll wait a long time. So here, because these molecules came out at about 70 and, you know, 75 or 80, whatever this ends up being, what I would probably try to do is put this at 50 and not even ramp it. So if I put this at 50 and don't even ramp it, what do I get? If I find out that now my first molecule doesn't come out till way over here, then maybe I started at 50 and ramp it at 5 degrees a minute or something like this. So a lot of this is trialing and trial and error, but lowering the GC initial temperature below 50 degrees, probably not a great idea. All right, last case. And the last case is a really challenging case um, because we have these molecules um, not coming out for about seven minutes, but also no baseline separation. So in this case, you're going to have to lower the ramp rate, okay? You may be able to get away with a higher initial temperature, but unfortunately, you're going to have to lower the ramp rate to baseline separate them. So what I would do is probably as a two-step process, I would first lower 
the ramp rate, okay, see what happens. Maybe then it takes 10 minutes for the first molecule to come out, but then when the second molecule comes out, if there's three or four minutes in between them, then I know I could start with a higher initial temperature. If I run them and it takes 10 minutes for the first one to come out and the second one comes out at 10.2 minutes, that's the best I'm going to do, okay? So it's a little bit of a trial and error thing. So quickly to review. If you have large amounts of separation and massive amounts of space before your peak, your first peak comes out, raise your initial temperature. If your molecules come out quickly but do not separate, decrease your ramp rate. I like to go to extremes. I would not ramp at all as a first approximation, see what happens, reassess based on what happens. If your molecules um, take a long time to come out but do not baseline separate, Unfortunately, they're gonna. This is going to be a, probably a long run, um, and you are going to um, need to uh, decrease your ramp rate and then play with your initial temperature to see if you can get those two molecules um, to both separate and come out in a reasonable amount of time. It may or may not be possible. It may be that this is a ten plus minute run to get these baselines separated. Sometimes that happens. Your goal is to separate these molecules. I will point out that they have substantially different boiling points. And as we talked about, the GC maidenly separates by boiling point. So you're, you shouldn't have huge problems to get these molecules to separate. Optimize your method. See how short of a method you can run and still get baseline separation. So baseline separation means you see any baseline between your two peaks. If you look in this case, we only have about 0.6 minutes between these. That's pretty good. We could get it down to theoretically 0.2 minutes. That's going to be hard to do, but it might not be impossible. So get your run as short as possible. You're also going to inject an unknown. Finally, I want to remind you one more time. You come in with a recipe of how to make your 20 millimolar solutions of this, 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 and this, all in the same solution with dichloromethane. What volume of this do you need to add? What volume of this? What volume of this? And what volume of this in order to make 100 milliliters of the solution? You want to make your solution as soon as you walk in the door, essentially, so that you're spending your time on the GC and you're not spending an hour making your initial solution. If you do that, it's going to take you too long to finish. Of course, you can come to office hours uh, for the TA or myself, um, and we'd be happy to um, help you with that. So I hope you found this video useful. I know it's a little bit longer than the other videos, but GC is super important for forensic chemistry. Many of the other things you've done this semester, with the probable exception of IR, are more forensic science in general um, and not so much forensic chemistry. I guess TLC is also used um, sparingly in um, forensic chemistry. However, GC, this is the meat of it. All right, this is the thing that you really need to um, be an expert at in order to uh, be a forensic scientist in the future, uh, forensic chemist in the future. So um, I hope you found this video helpful and thanks for watching.